Okay, we're ready to go. All right, well, welcome everyone, and thanks for coming along to tonight's 2022 Krebs Lecture. I'm Professor Richard Duncan, and along with my colleague, Professor Ross Thompson, we're co-directors of the Institute for Applied Ecology here at the University of Canberra that hosts the annual Krebs Lecture. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. I'll start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I want to uh, pay my, acknowledge and pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the lands on which the University of Canberra campus is situated. I want to acknowledge and respect their uh, ongoing contributions to the life of Canberra uh, and acknowledge their deep understanding and connection to the natural environment of this region. Pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and welcome any other First Nations people to the meeting tonight. I'm just going to run through a couple of housekeeping things um, before we get things rolling. Um, if you need to go to the toilet, they're located out the doors down the corridor and on your right. In the unlikely event of an emergency, there's two ways to get out of here. One is through the exits right there, or back out through the main foyer and the front doors that you came in, 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 in through tonight. Um, if you're starting to feel unwell, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, so if you do start to feel unwell, please get in contact with one of the staff members, Libby, or the people who will be out at the registration desk and just let them know. Uh, you can join in on the conversation tonight uh, on social media using the hashtag Krebs2022, and would encourage you to do that and to share the event across your social media platforms. And tonight's uh, panel discussion is also going to be uh, recorded and we'll put it up on YouTube at a later date. So if you want to re-watch it or let anyone know that wasn't here, that it's available, please, please do that. Uh, and then after we've finished the panel discussion tonight, we've got some food and drinks out in the foyer where you came in. Please stay and enjoy those and continue the discussion on with the panel members and, and among yourselves. All right, so thanks again for joining us. This is the 12th Krebs Lecture. The lecture series is named in honour of Professor Charlie Krebs, uh, who's one of the um, most eminent ecologists, I think, in the world. He is a Canadian. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He's written over 300 scientific publications, and he's perhaps best known for his ecology textbook, which is one of the most widely used ecology texts in the world. Unfortunately, uh, like last year, Charlie can't join us uh, here for the lecture. He usually comes and visits. He's a thinker of residence here at the Institute for Applied Ecology, and he's got a long association with the Institute. Uh, but we do have a video message that Charlie recorded, and we'll play that at the end. And we're hopeful that Charlie will be with us next year once uh, things loosen up and, and he can make it back here for another visit over the summer. All right, the topic of tonight's uh, event, a uh, talk is, or well, Discussion is, is de-extinction the solution? And rather than inviting a single speaker as we have in the past to present the Krebs Lecture, we thought it would be good to bring a more diverse set of viewpoints to this important topic. And so we've invited a panel of eminent experts who are going to discuss this. And the discussion is going to be facilitated by Ross. And it's my pleasure now to hand straight over to him and get things underway. Thanks. Thanks, Richard, and thanks, everybody, for coming along today. And I'd just also like to um, state my respect for traditional owners of this land. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our guests who are here this evening. So we have uh, guests who are senior members of the university, uh, special guests from our industry partners, from CSIRO, from various government departments, uh, from the FRDC, from the ACT government. Um, so welcome, and we're very grateful to have you here with us. And perhaps most of all, um, welcome to all of you as members of the Canberra community, which is a community that you see is both profoundly connected to and particularly committed to. So the Institute for Applied Ecology is, uh, aims to make an early and profound difference to the world around us through better management of our environment. Now almost 15 years old, the IE has contributed to the highest possible rating of five in the Excellence in Research Australia rating, ratings in its core areas of genetics, ecological applications and environmental management. Most recently, the research has been delivered through the Centre for Conservation, Ecology and Genomics, which Richard is Director of, and the Centre for Applied Water Science, which I'm Director of, all within the Faculty of Science and Technology. One of the themes of the Institute is about trying to approach the 
real challenges that we are experiencing globally to try and bring the very best research to bear on those challenges and really to take things all the way from fundamental science through to application. So we are passionate about meeting global challenges in areas across land and water, applying tools from genomics all the way through to the geosciences. And one of the things that we thought about this year was really looking at some of the emerging technologies around uh, dealing with the conservation crisis. And um, the idea of de-extinction is something that really captured us. Now, de-extinction is a fascinating area. It has uh, its roots in conservation biology. It then has moved on to using some of the very uh, cutting edge technologies that have come from molecular genetics. And of course, it has implications which uh, stretch across through to indigenous perspectives, ecological systems, and plays into the way in which humans and animals interact with one another and the history that is behind all of those interactions. So when we discussed this, we decided that representing that diversity of uh, topics and considerations was perhaps best achieved by having a panel discussion as opposed to having a single speaker as we have in previous years. And we have been extremely fortunate to have an eminent panel here today, and I'm going to introduce you to each of them in turn. Uh, first of all, right here is Andrew J. Pask. The J is apparently important. It's in there. It's, uh, Andrew is a professor in the School of Biosciences at the University of Melbourne. He does research in reproduction, developmental biology, endocrinology, and evolutionary biology. Most recently, he has led a research program aimed at decoding the genome of the Tasmanian tiger and understanding the potential for its de-extinction. So if you can join me in welcoming Andrew. Second along, we have Associate Professor Linda Williams from RMIT down in Melbourne. And she's a cultural historian with a focus on the interdisciplinary field of environmental humanities and studies in human-animal relations particularly histories of the long durée, which I'm going to need her to explain to me later, and their relation to the present day issues of climate change and mass species extinctions. So please welcome Linda Williams. <laughs> Moving along the row, uh, Professor Kerry Wilson is the Pro Vice Chancellor of Sustainability Strategy at Queensland University of Technology. Uh, she has over two decades of experience leading uh, conservation research uh, and uh, looking at the application of strategy and policy to conservation. She's particularly interested in applied resource allocation problems, such as how to lim invest limited resources to protect or restore biodiversity, and what socio-political and institutional factors influence investment success in conservation. Please welcome Kerry Wilson. And finally, down the end of the line, um, a person who we owe particular thanks to. We had, uh, had Greg Andrews on our original list. Greg currently has COVID. It was always going to happen to at least one member of the panel, wasn't it, at the moment? Um, and so thank you, profound thanks to Brad for stepping into the breach at short notice. Um, Associate Professor Bradley Mogridge is a Camilleroy man and Senior Research Fellow in Indigenous Water Science in the Centre for Applied Water Science at the University of Canberra. He's a national leader in Indigenous water science and has been recognised by awards which are far too numerous to mention. Through his role in the recently completed Threatened Species Hub, Brad has a strong understanding of biodiversity conservation in Australia from practical policy and Indigenous perspectives. So please welcome Brad Mogridge. So I want to get on with our discussion for today and I guess the context for all of this is the global biodiversity crisis. So we are facing rates of species loss that are around 10,000 times the long-term average of species loss, and around 100 times the rate of species loss seen during historical mass extinctions. That means we're outdoing a comet with respect to extinctions, which is quite astounding. Now, Australia has particular challenges in this area. It has the highest rate of vertebrate extinctions of any nation. And despite intensive management and policy interventions, this has continued unabated. Where we have lost species, which are particularly iconic, and the Tasmanian tiger, which you see on the screen there, is a good example of that. 
we have felt the profound sense of loss of something which is a really important part of our national heritage. And of course, recently with developments in molecular genetics, we've been able to ask ourselves the question, what if extinction was not forever? What if we could de-extinct species? And so modern molecular approaches are making it increasingly feasible to bring back extinct species. And internationally, efforts have focused on a diverse range of species, all the way from passenger pigeons through to woolly mammoths. So while the molecular science is advancing rapidly, there are, of course, a whole lot of questions around this issue, as there are with any of these major issues in conservation biology. How feasible is it? Are there concerns from ecological, ethical, and indigenous perspectives? Should we recreate extinct species or focus resources on preventing extinction? All of those issues are really important societal issues. And the aim of tonight's discussion really isn't to come up with particularly profound single answers. These are wicked problems. They're problems that have multiple different solutions depending on your societal perspective. And so what we want to do today is have a conversation, uh, represent a range of different opinions and perspectives, and hopefully you'll go away with um, a better set of knowledge to participate in the ongoing discussions around de-extinction and the applications of de-extinction. In order to start this off, what I've done is ask Andrew Pask to talk to us about the sort of technologies that have emerged in really the last decade that have started to make this idea of de-extinction feasible. So I'm going to pass over to Andrew and get us to give us the sort of beginner's guide to the technologies that underpin de-extinction. All right, seems like that's working. Um, so yeah, there, there have been some major advances in the last sort of 10 years really, which have taken this topic of de-extinction science from science fiction, from the realms of Jurassic Park into science fact, into things that we can actually can do today. And the real major advance that we saw was the ability to edit DNA genomes en masse, so to produce uh, thousands of very, very reliable DNA edits to a living cell um, in, in order to change the, the genome or the DNA of that living cell. The reason that technology is so important is we still can't create life from dead tissue. So you can't just find you know, something from a dead animal and then turn that back into a living organism. You have to still start with life. We still can't create life from nothing. And so the way that the extinction science works is what you have to do is sequence the genome of your extinct animal. So we're actually pretty good at extracting DNA from very old, even very ancient specimens. Thylacine's really great for this because Tassie tigers only went extinct 86 years ago. There's tons of specimens of them in museums that have been really nicely looked after. So they've got really nice intact DNA. We can get a beautiful uh, readout of their entire genome, their entire blueprint but we can't make that live again. So what we have to do is then find who is the closest living relative around today. So we can identify which animal has the most similar genome that's still alive, and then you take living cells from that animal and you use these advances in DNA editing technology to edit that genome or that template to now resemble that of your Tasmanian tiger. So we're essentially turning a living marsupial genome now into a Tasmanian tiger genome. So we're making all of those changes. Once you've done that, we can use technologies like IVF and cloning to turn that cell then back into a whole living animal, and that's how you do your, your de-extinction science. So doing these edits en masse is still something that is a huge, enormous and very costly task, which is why this still hasn't been achieved yet. But there's some groups in the US, the ones that you mentioned before, that are actually really close to having uh, some version of a mammoth, I would say, within the next five to ten years. And I think for something like the Tasmanian tiger, it's really feasible to think within a decade we would have that edited thylacine cell. We'd be ready to create our Tassie tiger. And uh, that's when it would be a very, uh, you know, real discussion to have about what do we want to do with that? Do we want to bring these species back? Obviously, I'm a very strong advocate for that, and I have a lot of reasons why I think we most definitely should, but I think we'll come to that later. Absolutely. Thank you for the... I'll have to tell everyone else, reminding everyone else to turn on their mic and then I forgot to. Um, so thank you for that. I think it's, it gives us the sort of the knowledge we need to go ahead with the rest of the conversation. I'm actually going to um, go flick to Linda first, um, once she's found the button on the microphone. And 
that also works. So Linda, do you put that in a sort of a perspective of the way in which historically humans and animals have interacted and the way humans have thought about animals? Well, I don't really want to go into the long durée at this point, but um, in more recent history, I think it's, um, uh, well, from a humanities uh, perspective, I'm interested in processes of um, deep cultural, sociocultural change. And I think we're beginning to see some of that in relation to climate change. Maybe the last election showed us that there's now a shift in the electorate. But when you were speaking about the we, um, that we, we, we feel this loss of the thylacine, I'm sure that's true for everybody here, but how deeply that's felt amongst the general populace is another kind of question. And um, I guess I have some very basic questions, and no doubt Andrew will address some of these later on. Um, but even with this uh, marvellous new scientific uh, technology and so forth, uh, my more basic question would be, well, if we bring these creatures back, where will they live? And um, how will they adapt to um, the world that we have, which is suffering from an environmental crisis. So I think the, um, the crisis of climate change and the one of um, biodiversity are connected, but it always surprises me how deeply anthropocentric the climate change debates are. Um, it's nearly always about how it's going to impact on human beings, and I understand that entirely. Um, <clears throat> but whether or not we'll see the kind of cultural change necessary uh, to develop new habitats for forthcoming um, species, if, they, if, we, if we get to that point with the science, is another kind of question. Sometimes I think cultural change happens very slowly, but other times, like um, if I can give an analogy, a friend of mine was um, telling me he was at his grandmother's country house about um, 30 or 40 years ago and in the foyer of this house. She must have had colonial fantasies, this grandmother, but she had an elephant's hook, foot that was hollowed out and it was used for umbrellas. And this was a, a point of pride in the, in the hallway as you went in the house. I'd put it to you that these days you'd want to hide that away. That would be pretty uncool um, to have something like that in your house. So there's a, a very distinct cultural change that's happened in that period. Whether or not we'll get an acceleration of change fast enough to address the crisis in biodiversity is another kind of question. But I have other points to make, but I'll go on to the next speaker. You've tried to me with two triggers there, and I, you, you talk about the cultural readiness for society to deal with the reintroduction of a predator and also the habitat readiness. And I think of something like the Yellowstone example where wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park yep. and where we saw both a cultural response because we had wolves killing cattle, uh, but we also saw a really significant um, ecological response. So I'm going to pass on to Kerry and ask her from an, from an ecological perspective What's your thoughts when you, when you hear this, the idea of recreating the thylacine and, and potentially reinserting them into ecosystems? Um, what, from an ecological perspective, does that trigger in you? Quite a lot, actually, um, as you can imagine, Ross. I kind of come from a similar sort of um, background. Um, and I guess more, even more broadly, from an um, environmental decision science perspective, it triggers a lot. Also, and you know, Linda's touched on a couple of those things too around feasibility. But to me, it kind of boils down to you know, what is the marginal benefit of this activity of de extinction, which is one of many activities that we can invest our time and energy in? What is the marginal benefit of that? What are the costs and what are the risks associated with it? So, specifically, some of the ecological considerations are um, will this um, revitalize species um, that we all seek to know and, and see in the flesh, there's no doubt about that, but will that revitalise species um, interact with existing species in a way that we can predict um, and manage effectively? Um, or will it be a new competitor in the landscape? And there's also kind of issues around, um, I guess, more broadly, will it provide, will it fulfil a desirable ecological role going forward. Given that our habitats are so changed and so modified now, um, 
but more fundamentally, it, it does raise questions in, for me about we have a whole range of contemporary threats to our biodiversity. Um, we're not doing all that well in abating those. And um, we, I, I guess there's the, you know, decisions around what's the best use of, of that funding. And, and I can unpack some of those criteria. Um, I also don't want it to be a um, argument against you, Andrew. So, you know, I mean, these are just thoughts and concepts that I'm throwing out. Yeah. Because Andrew and I had an interesting conversation when we were walking over here, really in that same sort of space, which is, which is around, you know, what is the relationship of this to conservation activities? Um, Andrew, do you want to just sort of provide a sort of a couple of minute summary of what we talked about earlier in terms of conservation and the role of this in conservation, how it may interact with what might be called traditional conservation activities? Yeah, so I, I always classify everything that we do in my lab as being next generation conservation science is really what we're working on. So every part or every step of technology that you need to de-extinct the thylacine are technologies that we need for conservation and preservation of existing marsupials right now. So one of the key things that we're doing is developing these ways of turning a living cell into a whole living uh, marsupial, as I mentioned before. Obviously, that's going to be important for us when we get our thylacine edited cell to turn that back into a living thylacine. But at the moment, with all these ongoing, you know, increasing severe weather events, we're creating biobanks of marsupial diversity and marsupial species where we're going out, collecting tissue from them and freezing them down to safeguard against their loss from those environments. So if you have a massive bushfire coming through and wiping out a species or even a subspecies or a certain selection of diversity, the idea is that you could go back to that biobank bank and recreate those animals and then put them back into that environment once the environment's had time to recover. And there's lots of places all over the world that are creating these frozen zoos or biobanks to make sure that we don't lose diversity that we already have. But what you need to be able to utilise that diversity or to utilise those biobanks is you have to have a way of going from that frozen tissue to a living animal. This is not the same as de-extinction science. You're not editing anything. You're literally taking that cell. If we freeze them in the right way, you can bring that cell back to life and then bring exactly that animal or that specific subvariant back to life. So that's a really important conservation tool that we have to have because we know we're not going to stop seeing severe weather events. We know, you know, we've almost lost a few species in the last one that happened, but we can safeguard against that loss using these technologies. The other thing that we're doing is obviously gene editing, ways of going in and gene editing uh, to, for, to, to help marsupials survive, basically, or to create things. There's some really great examples of where gene-edited marsupials might be of enormous benefit to saving species. One great example is with the spotted quoll that eats uh, cane toads and dies from cane toad toxin. But there's literally one gene in our genome that gives you resistance to cane toad toxin, and it's just one single amino acid that you need to change in that gene or in that protein to give an animal resistance to cane toad toxin. And this has evolved naturally, that resistance allele, in every single animal that coexists with cane toads or with buffonotoads, these toxic toads. And so if we had, you know, another 10, 15, you know, thousand years or hundreds of thousands of years to wait for our poor quolls to evolve this resistance, they would eventually become resistant to cane toads. Unfortunately, they're probably going to go extinct before we ever get to that point because the cane toads are just everywhere and they're eating them all the time. They're one of the most abundant um, food sources. But by doing just this one simple edit in their genome, you could create a cane toad toxin resistant quoll that's not only able to, you know, now survive in the face of cane toads, but could actually eat the ecological problem that cane toads are and hopefully help control their population. So there's very simple things that you can do like that with this technology. So this is definitely not at odds with conservation science. Everything we do is conservation technologies that we, we should have right now for marsupials. Um, it's just that they all also underpin this final sort of ultimate big goal of trying to bring something back that's uh, been extinct. Thanks, Andrew. Now, Brad, I haven't forgotten you down the end there, I promise. Um, but Linda's been looking pointedly at me. So, Linda, do you have something? Very to, happy to, for to, And then, then I'll pass on to Brad after that. So, I was just going to say, um, I see this as a primarily as a human problem as well as potentially one that's providing human solutions. And you gave the example um, of um, the Yellowstone Park and George Monbiot made that fantastic uh, video about how wolves change the course of rivers and so on. Um, but in Australia, um, the thylacine and I think the... Um, the Tassie devil went extinct around about the same time. I think it's like three, 
3,200 years ago, or the study in Adelaide suggested that. Um, and still, we still don't know what the actual causes are, but one of them is very likely climate change because there was an exaggeration of the southern oscillation at that point. And, and it was also um, a bit before that when there was a new uh, introduced predator, the dingo. Um, all of those problems are now with us today and they're still extant. In fact, they're more extreme than they were then. So... Um, assuming we can introduce these species back into um, into Australia, my, my question remains, where are they going to live? I mean, right now they've reintroduced um, trucks um, um, travelling at night at high speed in Tassie near a mine um, and they're um, killing um, species as we, as we speak um, in roadkill. So it's not as if we've got this kind of Yellowstone situation over here and people over there. We're, we're all in it together. Sorry, I just wanted to. Wanted Thank to you. I, I think it's a really interesting question. I think it's one of the things that we would talk about today with all of these things, that there's um, our biodiversity is being assaulted by multiple insults. Habitat loss, climate change, um, pollutants, uh, hunting, all sorts of things. And, you know, when we focus on any one technology, it's clearly not going to be enough. And I think that there's that question of, does this give us a get-out-of-jail-free card? And I think it clearly doesn't. Now, Brad, um, you would have noticed if you saw his biography picture before that he had a large hat on, and that's because Brad's wearing two hats here today. Um, Brad was involved as um, one of the advisors for the uh, Threatened Species Hub, which recently finished, uh, and he's also here to provide us with an Indigenous perspective. So, Brad, based on what you've heard so far today, thoughts, reflections? Uh, I suppose if we go back 234 years, there was no extinctions. Um, and I suppose Aboriginal people have been part of this landscape for a lot longer, so they would have seen recent species come and go. They would have had cultural connection to some of those species. No doubt the Tassie tiger, no doubt. Um, and I think there's opportunity there for re-engaging in, in, in an old knowledge set. Uh, and I think science is failing to do that. So the Threatened Species Recovery Hub, you know, as... as past few years, you know, tried to do that with a number of species and, like, we've got the, the challenge of, you know, if species have gone, potentially language goes with it, potentially a totem goes with it, potentially a food source goes with it. So I suppose it's those sort of aspects aren't considered in, um, I suppose, species management. Um, so, like, yeah, if a, a language term disappears with that species that word's gone forever. And so unless that species comes back, then potentially you could reignite that. It's the same as, like, water places. They're similar scenarios. So, like, if the mob that found the, the night parrot in WA, you know, so the, the rangers out there found it and photographed it and, and recorded its calling and, you know, those sort of things are exciting for that mob. But then that night parrot could have been quite tasty. So you don't know. So um, I think there's... Bringing back species, I think I like your point about is country is country ready for it? I suppose when these species have gone, country was a lot different back then, um, and I suppose you know climate has changed, um, you know, predators have changed. Um, an example is the the latest buzz thing is those predator proof fences, you know, so the predator proof enclosures. So I've got one here in North Canberra, um, Mulligan's Flat. You know, there's there's species there that haven't been on mainland Australia for some time. So they've come from other parts of oh, Tassie, I think, the, the Beton come from. Um, so those, those species are, are returning and, you know, like um, we had some Yaru from Broome come over to Canberra to see a predator-proof enclosure and they wanted to see um, uh, mulligans. And they were a bit sceptical around the predator-proof enclosures and they are worried about fire and all that sort of thing. But what they they got to see was betongs. They were the only ones seeing betongs on mainland Australia at that point in time. And so that sort of excited them to say that they can protect their species. So they got a couple of big cultural species like the, the Parenti, the, the big goanna, um, and they've got the cane toad marching down towards their country. So 
they, they want to get ahead of the cane toad to, to protect their cultural species. Brad, I'm going to direct a question to Kerry, and I, would, I want to answer this question, but I'm going to ask Kerry to do it anyway. We talk about reinserting species like the Tasmanian tiger back into these ecological systems which have been altered. Are we at a stage where, of ecological modelling where we can model what the outcomes of something like that would be? Can we carry out, go back to traditional owners, ask them about the relationships of the Tasmanian tiger to other things in their oral history, put that into a computer and churn the big wheel and model outcomes from reintroducing a species like this? Well, you're right. It would re require a kind of a broad um, set of evidence around it. And, you know, with permission of um, traditional owners, I'm sure that would, um, you know, bring a lot of information um, forward. The, I guess the, the, the challenge is we're dealing with uncertain parameters. We will be because they're, you know, the um, thylacine was, what, 86 years ago. So there will be knowledge lost in that, in that intervening period. And we're dealing with uncertain contemporary factors. So, you know, in terms of the environmental um, conditions and the predicted conditions in the future too. So this, these predictions that you're talking about are possible, but they will be highly uncertain. And the, I guess, capturing within that decision context that I was referring to before of the benefits and the costs and the feasibility is then layering in this uncertainty and how tolerant um, community and society and, um, and the decision makers making these decisions are to that uncertainty is another, I guess, component of this problem that we would need to elicit. What are, the, what are the tolerances that we have to risks of things not going the way that we plan it? And we don't often ask those questions and seek to, to understand that before we launch right in to some um, solution or, or some mitigation measure. Um, but I think we, in this case, it would be a really, I guess, a really good example of having to be quite savvy in how you navigate uncertainties um, and also that varying preferences um, in society to the consequences as well. So I think the modelling approaches are there. I think that it's a broader set of methods that would need to be put, put to play on the question. Yeah. And this gets, I think, to what all of you have been saying, that there's a social component to these decisions. And, and it's just one of the reasons we want to have this conversation here today is to try and bring in that social component to, and to think about those issues. Now, you've touched, Kerry, a couple of times about sort of ideas of resource allocation. And, and one of the things that we hear when we talk about these sort of large molecular approaches is people saying, oh, if you've spent the same money on buying X amount of landscape, you could save X amount of species. So, you know, why don't we just do that? Um, so in terms of uh, resources and the way we spend resources, um, I'm not going to pick on Andrew first this time. Do, do we feel like if we have a limited pool of resources, this would be the priority. Do we feel like it's as simple a question as that? And I'm going to come to Andrew at the end because we've, again, had a bit of a pre-conversation about this. But what do we feel like in terms of resources and the availability of limited resources for conservation? Is this a priority you see? Is that, or, or do you think that, you know, we're putting the cart before the horse? Lynn? Um Under current conditions, I feel that there are other priorities. Having said that, though, I mean, I think it's worth noting that um, the research funding in this country is very poor, um, you know, percentage in relation to GDP. GDP um, in the developed countries, we're one of the poorest in, in terms of research funding. Uh, another caveat I want to make is that I think there's a very important role for blue sky research, so-called, I mean, it's been great hearing the potential applications from, from Andrew, um, but I think there are some more immediate crises that need addressing. Um, and I think another problem we have with research is, and this is not a plug for a dialogue, more dialogue between the sciences and the humanities, but um, the, the very kind of focused nature of um, 
research. I understand why it's necessary at a scientific level, but also, um, I mean, we're, we're talking about these broader ecological and societal issues. They seem to me to be crucial to the long-term success of these projects. And um, the nature of research as we have it is very singular and, and focused. I, I wonder if there's not a role for more a more inclusive approach. But given the thinness of research funding at the moment, I can think of, I think it's more important to protect the endangered species that we have. Um, yeah. Brad, I'm going to throw to you, and you know, you've been involved in the Threatened Species Hub recently, and um, thoughts on that issue of around how do we best spend limited resources in order to protect biodiversity? I think Australia has an extinction problem. Um, so it's it, the challenge is we can't we don't have enough funds to look after the vulnerable species now, let alone reintroducing extinct species. So I suppose the how are we going to do that? You know, is and we were talking about earlier is 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 the country ready for it? And will the country um, and I suppose knowledge and culture be ready for those species to come back? But I think yeah the when you look at the threatened species list, yeah, there's a lot on there and there's only, you know, there's new ones and some sort of duck off now and again and some come back on. And But I think the, the challenge is that we don't have enough resources or research to actually look after them, the ones we have. And, you know, if you, no doubt, like if I sp spoke to my elders about the species on my country, you know, there's potentially species that are threatened somewhere else, or they're not threatened they're not on the list, but they're cultural species, but they're rare on our country. But we don't get a cent of funding to protect those species. So I suppose it's it's another challenge for us to, to bring to the fore. And, you know, the, the current legislation doesn't allow for that either. Yeah. I'm going to throw to Andrew, because I know, you know, this is, I said, something we, we talked about. And, you know, there is always an issue around resource allocation. And there is particularly an issue where we have high-profile research, which can both... Um, highlight lacks of resources, but can also generate resources. So uh, what's your feeling to, you know, there's always going to be someone who says, I can't believe they've given that guy at the University of Melbourne all this money to do extinct things when we can't save the stuff we've got left now. So uh, I'll start off by saying I've never received money from any of the conservation funds to do this. This has all come from either philanthropy or from biotech industry funding to drive this research. And it is fundamental conservation biology. So instead of actually detracting money away from conservation biology, I've actually brought millions of dollars into marsupial conservation biology and developing these technologies and tools to safeguard our living marsupials from further extinction events as a result of having this sort of blue sky, uh, you know, objective of trying to bring back an extinct species. And I think, like you said, it's really important to have some of those major goals, you know, it's like, you know, can we go to the moon, all those sorts of things. Can we do something like this? Can we bring an extinct animal back? And I think they, they, it does capture the imagination of people. It does get people talking about extinctions talking about the limitations of that and the problems of what it would be to reintroduce that species, is it going to occupy exactly that same uh, niche or that location in the, in the ecology of that environment to make this a safe thing to do? It's never going to be as good as protecting living species from extinction. So I wouldn't say, it's the, is it the solution? No, but it might be one of the solutions and a really important tool that we have in our toolkit to safeguard animals, really important species and to bring those animals back. So this doesn't take money away from conservation research. In fact, it brings enormous amounts of money into it. So this has been the, the most well-funded project I've ever worked on in my lab. So we have now $5 million to work on really trying to bring this animal back. But developing all of those really critical marsupial technologies that we just don't have, ways of creating marsupial stem cells, ways of doing IVF in marsupials, ways of creating, you know, a, a living marsupial from that biobank tissue. All of these things would not have been funded unless it was for, you know, pitching a big blue sky, uh, you know, objective, like trying to bring the thylacine back and accessing those alternative sources of money. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, $5 million is an amazing amount of money, yet also when you think about it, your average major road bridge costs $5 million, and yet here we are saying $5 million to de-extinct something from our nation's heritage. And so 
Yes, indeed, it's a lot of money, but boy, we spend a lot of money on other things, don't we? Linda, what do you? Yeah, could I just ask you about that? I mean, I don't know that much about your funding, and I, I hope this is okay to ask, but um, who are the funders and what is their interest in, in doing this? Uh, so the, the, the business side of things are people who are really interested in uh, ways that you can edit genomes and, and, and do that. There's a lot of potential of that in medicine, for example, in being able to do you know, good gene editing in a genome very faithfully and reproducibly, producing a viable living thing. Obviously, we can't do that in humans to see if it works, so this is a great way of sort of testing some of that technology. And the philanthropic donation that we got, uh, you know, came from a very wealthy uh, Australian who just really felt connected to the thylacine, really loved the thylacine, was very saddened by its de-extinction and was just looking for people who were working in this space to see if he could fund um, some of this research. So this is somebody who could have bought, you know, another yacht or another penthouse in Melbourne or something else, but instead decided to give that money to de-extincting the thylacine, to marsupial conservation biology which again is, you know, where you, know, you wouldn't get that money normally. So it's been a, a really, you know, amazing way of, of getting the funding to do some really important science. May I ask another question? All right, then. <laughs> do you think it's possible that if you were successful in um, constructing, resurrecting, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, a thylacine, um, that you would uh, bring it into a world where it would be likely to suffer? So I think, you know, this is a really good point. So my idea of doing this is definitely not to create animals that we can go and have in a zoo and go and pat. It's because the thylacine was such an incredibly unique marsupial and it held a really incredibly unique place in the food chain in Tasmania. It was really important for stabilising the entire ecosystem beneath it. It was our only apex predator that we had in marsupials, which is really unusual. If you think about other mammals, there are squillions of examples of apex predators. Bears, wolves, foxes, killer whales, you can think of so many examples. But in marsupials, that was it. That was the only one that we had. And so there's nothing else in that environment that can occupy that niche. It was really incredibly important. So for species like this, that are a recent extinction, completely human driven, persecuted, you know, they were paying a pound per skin for the thylacine back at the turn of the, the 19th century. So you, that was a hugely lucrative business for farmers. It was much more lucrative for them to go out and kill thylacines than it was to, hunt, than to actually farm the land. And so, you know, in the, the course of 30 years, they completely wiped thylacines off from Tasmania. I think for those kinds of species that are so important, recent extinctions, the, the ecosystem in Tasmania hasn't changed that much. It's not a crazy, enormous change in the last 86 years. The animals that it ate are still there. There are viable habitats still there. This is the kind of species, if we're thinking about de-extincting anything, this is the kind of one that we should be thinking about bringing back. I think there are a lot of really, really good arguments for why this one in particular. And I'm not an advocate for bringing back every animal that's gone extinct. We all saw Jurassic Park. It was a terrible idea. But I think there are some animals where you really, it would be a really great thing and potentially very beneficial. But you would have to do the studying of this animal extensively. You're not, I'm not going to create a thylacine and then just let it run off on Tasmania tomorrow. This is something that you would have to study in, you know, very large fence-off areas for enormous amounts of time before you'd have the confidence that you could put that animal back into the environment. And that is something that the ecologist would do, not me. I'm a molecular biologist, and that's where I think the ecologist would have to really step in and have a look at that. And we don't know what they behave like. We don't know what is normal, typical thylacine behaviour because nobody really recorded it or did a very good description of that. So that, that's part of the, the controversy and the issues we have to think about with, with doing something like this is how will we ever really know? So the best you could do is create something, put it back in the environment, see what it does. Okay, I'm going to open the conversation out to the floor. So there's a microphone over here. So if you want to come and ask a question, please position yourself behind the microphone. While you do that, though, I thought to lighten the mood a little bit, um, looking along the row, you can wave your magic wand, you can bring back any species that's extinct you want. Which one are you going to bring back, Brad? I think the, the giant emu megafauna. Just imagine the drumstick. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. I'm with you. I'm with you. Love Kentucky Fried, Kentucky Fried Emu, delicious. Kerry. Um, yeah, it's a great question. It's not one that I would answer, though. I don't think it's our responsibility to answer that. I'd be looking to my kids 
and asking them, what would you want us to bring back? Because they're the ones that will live with the consequences of it. Um, they'll be the ones righting the wrongs in the, in the future if there are issues that emerge. Um, and they'll be the ones that are celebrating it too. Um, I'm, I'm kind of sick of my generation <laughs> making these decisions on behalf of my children. Um, I'd prefer to be um, soliciting their, their advice, actually. Well, you took the fun out of that, didn't you? Sorry. <laughs> Linda, if you can bring anything back, are you going to? Oh, perhaps half seriously in a sci-fi kind of way, um, since we all carry a bit of um, Neanderthal genes, I'd recommend bringing back a Neanderthal and ask them where we went wrong. <laughs> Okay, Andrew, not, no. allowed, not allowed to be the thylacine. It's got to be something else. I mean, a, a mammoth. I would love to see a mammoth. I think that would just be an incredible thing to see. And I think we probably will in our lifetime see a mammoth. So that's cool. So I'm going to uh, make my suggestion as well. Um, my university has been uh, particularly enthusiastic about spin-out companies and stuff. So I'm going to recreate the giant wombat with a spin-out industry of mud brick houses from their square poos. Because if you think of how big the square poo must have been from a hippo-sized wombat, it would have been darned useful. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple of questions from the floor. Um, so anyone, direct your question to anyone you wish, or anyone can put your hand, wave out at me to reply. Oh, is it not? All right, okay. Hello, um, I have two questions. Uh, well. I have about a million, but I'm only going to ask two. Um, the first one I'm going to direct at Andrew. Um, so in this de-extinction process, um, if you are, like, if you do get to the point where you are releasing these animals into the wild and kind of, you know, letting them go through their life cycle and whatnot, um, are you able, with your, like, gene editing, to be able to give enough diversity in a population for it to be able to sustain itself? Um, and how does that kind of look long term? Um, and do you want me to wait and then ask the next let one? Him, let him do that one. All right, okay. <laughs> Great question, by the way. Thank you. Um, so we are sequencing almost every single thylacine specimen that we can get our hands on at the moment to get a really good understanding of population diversity. They were collected over about 100 years. So we've got some from, you know, pre-hunting them right the way through to when they were being aggressively hunted as part of the bounty. Loads of specimens around the globe. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of thylacine uh, specimens we can get our hands on, which is really nice. And being 86 years old or, you know, maybe 150 years old, the DNA's still enough quality that we can actually get a really good sense of what their population diversity look like. Once we get to the point of editing everything that we need to turn our Dunart cell into a thylacine, editing in that variation is really not that big a deal. That's, that's sort of like the, the easier bit. So we feel confident that we could make a good amount of variation in that population. What that variation looks like in terms of actual health for those animals is something you would have to see with a living animal. It's very hard for us to even uh, understand what those subtle differences in the genomes actually manifest as in the living animal. But again, you know, we have a lot of animals around today that are on the brink of extinction that are very, very small population numbers that have been managed back to having really healthy, viable populations through really good, rigorous breeding programs and our own management of them. So I think even if you had a limited amount of diversity in your initial population through very careful management, we know we can make that a sustainable population and hopefully over time they'll accrue, you know, those differences in their DNA to become a really healthy population again. But we certainly aim to have a population of thylacines and a diversity in those thylacines that we recreate so they wouldn't just survive but be able to thrive back in that environment. You're going to get another yeah. sneaky question then, aren't you? I, I am, yes. Um, <laughs> um, it's not on that, but that is... Amazing to you. Um, uh, my other question is quite unrelated and is more directed towards Brad and, um, like, so obviously there is not a lot of Indigenous knowledge within Tasmania um, through some pretty terrible historic events. Um, so there's not that much known about their behaviour. Andrew, you touched on that very briefly. Um, when we are in, like, if we are to reintroduce it, how do we know that, like, its behaviour, its temperament, like, um, even if you have a really good population in captivity, um, how tigers react uh, and behave in a zoo is very different to how tigers react out in the wild. Um, how are you going to kind of manage 
those different kind of behaviors that erupt and also like kind of monitor that so that you can have a good understanding from both like um, an ecological and an indigenous point of view and being able to incorporate that into like, I guess the, the, the people that are there on country now as well as like those who will be there in the future. So I'm going to give Andrew time to draw breath, but <laughs> Brad, I mean, it's a long way from your country, but what do you feel, I mean, what's, what's your knowledge about how intact some of the traditional knowledge is around thylacines and, and that ecosystem? Well, that's a good question. Um, but I suppose, yeah, because it's a long way from my country, I probably wouldn't have... I don't have any knowledge about the thylacine. Um, stories may exist, um, but I reckon no one's asked the Palama Mob. No one's asked them. So I suppose it's... If they have, you know, they're... They, you know, they were pretty much slaughtered like, you know, their, their skulls would have been trophies like the elephant foot on mantelpieces in Tasmania. Um, so I suppose it's the challenge is there needs to be a, a conversation, you know, a respectful conversation over time. You know, science is part of the problem as well, you know, that it doesn't acknowledge traditional knowledge as evidence. So I suppose, I've got to stop saying suppose. Um, I suppose <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that the challenge is for science is can it, can it evolve as well to, mm. to consider Indigenous knowledge as, as, you know, the thousands of generations of observation that it is. Um, you know, like there's, there's just sort of Western validation of traditional knowledge happening now, you know, with, you know, the, the rise of the... the waters in Port Phillip Bay that those stories were told and retold. So that's a, a story that survived. You know, there might be stories of the thylacine. So I, I don't know personally, but that they could be out there. But there, there needs to be that respectful conversation and whether, they're, whether they wish to talk about it as well. You know, they might be too, they might be too sad. You know, no one's, no one's really explored the impact. You know, it's the same for, you know, bogon moths here in Canberra you know, in, in the snowy country. Everyone's worried about the mountain pygmy possum, but what, what about the cultural connection Aboriginal people have in the high country and from the coast that are coming up to those big ceremonies to collect the, the, um, the bogon moth? Um, you know, there's a lot of issues, but, yeah, now the bogon moth is full of pesticides. So there's a real challenge there. So there's, those conversations just don't happen. Um, so there's an incredible number of cave paintings of thylacines uh, in mostly in Northern Territory. So they're all up in the north. But, you know, as you mentioned before, they went extinct in the mainland probably about, we think, somewhere around 4,000 years ago. So they've been gone for so long from those cultures that, were, that really seem to appreciate and have a deep connection to the thylacine. And then obviously, you know, they only persisted in modern times in Tasmania. And as you mentioned before, they, we sort of lost that entire population there of, of Indigenous people who would have had a, a, you know, a more recent connection with them. So it's, it's really sad to see that loss. But they're incredible cave paintings of thylacines. You should all Google them because there's some really incredible ones and some really beautiful rock carvings as well that they've done on the Tasmanian tigers, even with the, the pouch young in the pouch and everything. So they're really some incredible art. So do you think the extinction on the mainland, um, because it was coeval with the introduction of the dingoes, was largely due to that or do you think it was due to climate change or both? Uh, probably both. So definitely, you know, there would still be environment here that the thylacine could have lived in on the mainland. But yeah, there was the dingo and people around at the time. And so, yeah, that's the popular theory is that it was probably outcompeted on the mainland. Just building on this woman's question, who would the thylacine's mother be? It's a good question. Which pouch? Who would she carry? And who would be the carrier? So we're using the fat-tailed dunnart as our surrogate species. Uh, so just for all of you, your knowledge, they're about the size of a mouse. 
So you might go, hang on a second, how does this work? Well, the great thing about marsupials is they all give birth to tiny little babies, as you know. So most Dazirids, which is what this uh, animal was part of that group, their babies are actually about the size of a grain of rice, not even a big grain of rice, like an arboreo grain of rice, the little one that you make risotto from. And so a Dunart can give birth to a thylacine, and then once they're born, you can actually rear them on milk, um, so getting to your behaviour question, the second part of your question, circling back to that, um, is one of the good things about marsupials for our perspective, not great for marsupials, is they have actually pretty small brains compared to other mammals. They have a, <laughs> quite a limited uh, capacity to do deep thinking. A lot of their behaviours are innate and pre-programmed in their brain. And so we think if you're you know, able to bring this species, you know, really reproduce that complete genome back, you would have an animal that had pretty normal behaviour. There are obviously a lot of animals that are reared all the time from their mothers that get abandoned from them or the mum gets killed as a roadkill or whatever. And you can train those animals to have hunting behaviours, other sorts of behaviours if you need to. I do think a thylacine would have all of those behaviours hardwired in its brain, but even if not, over a few generations, you know, living in, in that same environment, you would think it should be able to pick those behaviours back up again. They used to say that about bird brains, um, that they were, you know, birds were, were yeah. kind of dumb. But the other point to make about birds is that they apparently learn how to sing from inside the egg because they can hear their mothers singing to them. It's just, you know, animals have cultural transmissions too, as Darwin explained. Yep. So I'm still stuck on thylacine risotto, frankly. But um, <laughs> um, you don't get a third question, I'm sorry. So if we can move to our next question from the floor. <laughs> Let's see if we'll see Kerry. We're gonna we're gonna put Kerry on the spot. Okay, I guess um, you know in determining the marginal benefit, as I spoke about before, some of that would be ecological. You know, the possibility of controlling other introduced species, the, the, the flow-on effects for habitat there, um, but also more kind of socio-economic as well. So, can revitalising extinct species would that um, I guess gather more support for conservation? Um, you know, enlighten people about the extinction crisis that we're experiencing and, and I guess, motivate people to prevent more extinctions in the future because they can see, that, you know, the trouble that the likes of Andrew is going to to bring them back um, as well. So I guess, you know, that, that question of what is the benefit of this activity is a, is a broader question than just the... Um, the recovery of an extinct species. It's those, you know, those, the, the broader ecological and social economic benefits as well. Um, yeah, so it's, it wouldn't be an easy accounting problem um, at all. We are getting to the end of our time, so I'm going to move on to our next question from the floor, and we're going to turn on the microphone so that it <laughs> appears on the YouTube clip. So, Burns, question for the panel. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a little bit sorry because you almost touched the answer before, but I took all my bravery and stand there, and so I thought I'd I ask it anyway. So I int introduced very quickly a thought experiment. Think about humans went extinct, and dolphins decide, oh, why don't we de-extinct the humans? Because, you know, they have been part of the habitat before, and, and your answer was a little bit, yeah, no, they're hardwired, and they become back. But, you know, just using that experiment, I guess, raised by dolphins in whatever environment there, humans probably will never become what they were before. So the question is, would you think that thylacines will become basically the same they were before, or you create a, yeah, whatever way you go, something different, or you create a monster? What, what, what is your thoughts about that? <laughs> so in this scenario, did the dolphins hunt us to extinction? This is my question. No. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, it, it, I mean, it's a really good question. So we don't know because we don't have a good understanding of what normal thylacine behaviour is. But we do know that you can take orphaned animals, you can rear them, you know, with other surrogate species and they will adopt their normal behaviours eventually. They can revert back to, you know, the hunting animal is always going to be a hunting animal, uh, a predatory animal or, a, you know, a prey species is always going to be a 
parade species, they don't really change a lot about their physiology. Uh, you know, there may be some things that are handed down over time from mother thylacine to baby thylacines that we don't know about, but I would think that you would be able to recreate that over time. It may take some time to get to those normal behaviours, but for sure, I think you could, you could do it. But, you know, you know, we have a bit of variation. Everybody in the room here has DNA that's very different from the person sitting next to them. We vary by over 1% of our genome from the individual sitting next to you. I would think by the time we bring our thylacine back, it'll probably vary about 1% from, you know, what the original specimen was. And, you know, we're all normal functioning humans, I assume, in the room. Um, so, you know, I think there'll be variation in their behaviour, just like there's variation in all of our behaviours. But I think that's something that you would want in your sort of healthy population that you bring back. And I'm going to be looking very suspiciously at dolphins. <laughs> Carl, one last question from the floor. Um, so I know you've been working on the thylacine for a while, and I've been working on the gastric group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for this, this first one for marsupials, right, a lot of the technology that we have to develop, this sort of basic stepping stones, would make it incredibly easier, like a massive head start for doing the next marsupial that went extinct. So, you know, you could do something like a pig-footed polaroo or something like that. So there, there are other examples of other ones that we could definitely attempt to do. So, yeah, it definitely makes it a lot easier. The advances that we're making in the DNA editing technology and the techniques that we use to check that and, you know, you know get that, that gene edited cell also has all sorts of other benefits for editing out diseased genes in the human populations, in livestock and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of things that you can do with that technology as well. So there's definitely a lot of, you know, potential applications of this further for other species. The only real thing limit on de-extinction is how long that animal has been extinct for and whether you can get good DNA from it. So you'll be relieved to know that you cannot get DNA for dinosaurs. It's not in uh, mosquitoes trapped in amber. That's not a thing. So uh, we're not going to be de-extincting uh, dinosaurs anytime soon. But one of the things that we do interestingly with this, uh, you know, figuring out what their DNA look like is we do these ancestral reconstructions of genomes. So you could sort of theorise what a a you know, dinosaur genome would look like, and then with this technology you could create that into a living animal. So they're the sorts of things that I think people will really have to have a discussion about, you know, what you do, reproducing something that did exist versus creating something that is a, a monster that you could release uh, in the environment will be two very different things. Okay, now I think we could continue this conversation for quite a long time, but what we're going to do is shift the format of this conversation. So I'm going to do a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm going to um, give our, our panellists some uh, gifts and I'm going to ask you for your applause. While we're doing that, we're going to queue up uh, Charlie's video message um, from Canada, all the way from Canada. I know Charlie's very sorry not to be able to be here today and he's aware of the topic and interested in the topic. Um, so while that video is being queued up, I'm going to give you um, a series of grossly over-branded University of Canberra gifts. Um, so Brad will be particularly appreciative given that he works here. Um, so if you can join with me in thanking Brad Mogridge. <laughs> Kerry Wilson. Linda Williams. And the particularly hardworking Andrew Pass. So let's hear from Charlie. This is Charles Krebs in Canada. I'm unable to get to Canberra for the Krebs lecture and discussion this year, uh, but I wanted to uh, greet all of you and, and make a few points. Conservation is achieved on three different planes by the scientists, which is largely what we're talking about tonight, the public and policies uh, generally generated by the government. Conservation science itself works at four levels, and that is the immediate protection of endangered species, and the protection of habitats, again, very important, monitoring of all of these things to see what we are doing, what we are achieving, and the application of ecological advances, including genomics, which is the topic of this evening's discussion. Now, funding at all of these four levels of conservation is set in the first case by the government and by private foundations. 
But in the long term, what is crucial are public demands for action on conservation problems. Uh, this discussion on de-extinction is exactly what we need, both to communicate to the public what the issues are and to generate demand for action. We need discussion of varying plans of action to push conservation solutions forward. Now, de-extinction is a new approach on the conservation block and follows as a part of the general issue of rewilding of ecological communities. We require careful, ongoing discussions of the consequences of the progress and the failure of all aspects of conservation. How well are we doing? What kind of a future do we see for our country? These are difficult questions, and we must assay progress on all fronts. Conservation is not a science for a one-track mind, but is a community effort for all of us. Thank you. So I don't think I can add anything to what Charlie has just said as a brilliant summary of everything that we've talked about today. A couple of last minor housekeeping issues. Um, I'd like to particularly thank Lebby and the team on the front desk and also the student volunteers who've helped out today. As all of you will be aware, the people who do the heavy lifting are the people in the background who do it. So thank you very much to all of you uh, for that. <laughs> And perhaps the thing that will be most worthy of applause for the entire day, we have food and wine waiting for you in the foyer. Um, do feel free to continue the conversation. I know that our panel will be out there to have a chat uh, and uh, come out and join us. Thank you for participating in the conversation today. I think it's been a really fascinating one. I know I've learned a lot. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all back for the Krebs Lecture in 2023.